Uh, my name is Clark Murdoch. I'm the director for the project uh, on nuclear issues. Uh, I was just talking with uh, one of the panelists here, Kingston, who actually attended the first debate, which I believe was in September of 2008, uh, between myself and Joe Sorencioni over the RRW. I'm pretty sure it was there because the RRW was killed a little bit later in the year. <laughs> it wouldn't have still had a debate on it at that time. Uh, I became infamous among many of my uh, employees at the time who were former national collegiate debaters because I gave a long-winded orientation and uh, pro orientation, and they were saying, "Where's the question? Where's the question?" I said, "Isn't that so, Joe?" <laughs> Not quite the spirit of debate. Anyway, uh, I'm going to introduce Sarah Weiner. She is the uh, program coordinator for Pony. This is her second to last function when she leaves in about a month's time uh, to take a few months off before she goes to law school. And Sarah Minot, stand up, Sarah. I have another Sarah that's going to take Sarah Weiner's place, and she will be, uh, she's attending this event and another event, and will be joining us full time in a couple of weeks. Uh, uh, and taking over some very big shoes from Sarah. Anyway, Sarah, if you'd introduce the speakers. Thanks, Clark. Please, everyone, feel free to kind of shuffle up. up. We've got plenty of seats up here in the front. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice a little bit. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, like Clark said, we've been doing this debate series for a while, and I think it's a really valuable and interesting way to get people uh, to move past what are sometimes shift passing in the light, ships passing in the night. I'm going to really engage in some controversial debates. I'm very excited about the topic we have tonight. Um, I think it will generate some good discussion. Um, you all <clears throat> are probably handed a handout like this, but uh, the resolution that is being debated tonight is resolved. In response to the Crimea crisis, the United States should reassess the strategic rationale for not placing NATO's tactical nuclear weapons into Central and Eastern European states. Um, Peter Duran, who's Director of Research at the Center for European Policy Analysis, where he also leads the Center's Eastern Lights and Energy Horizons programs. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll be taking the affirmative. And Kingston Reef, Director of the Nuclear Nonproliferation at the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation, um, will be taking the negative. You have their bios in front of you, so I won't offend um, your, uh, your reading abilities by reading any more of that to you. Uh, the format will go as follows. We'll have each of them make a 10-minute opening statement then they'll have an opportunity to ask questions of each other for five minutes each. Um, I'll ask them a few questions, then we'll open it up for about 20 minutes of questions from you all, so I encourage you all to think about questions. Also, for folks who are watching the live stream of this debate, um, you can email your questions to pony, P-O-N-I, at csis.org, um, and I'll read those questions for you as long as you identify uh, who you are and where you're from. Um, and then at the end, uh, both debaters will have an opportunity to make a five-minute closing statement. Um, so that's all the logistical information and how things will proceed tonight. Um, and with that, I'll invite you to, to go ahead and start. Okay. Yeah, I think that's best. Thank you very much. I, I want to start by thanking uh, CSIS and for the opportunity to have this discussion. There are very few topics right now on the policy debate agenda that, um, that are as relevant or as timely as, as the one we have today. Uh, in framing some of my initial thoughts for this conversation, I, I thought it would be best to maybe channel a little of, of Winston Churchill. When, when he spoke in 1938 to, to the uh, House of Commons, he said, I will begin by saying the most unpopular and most unwelcome thing. The world as we know it has changed. After Crimea, that world is more dangerous, and we endanger ourselves and our allies by sticking to old assumptions, strategic templates, and yesterday's solutions to today's uh, threats. So what's changed? Well, we live now in a more perilous en environment than we enjoyed in, say, 2000, uh, 1996 or, or 1999. Uh, that was a time, if you recall, when NATO's nuclear posture, as we know it today, was established. It was a time when NATO's basing concepts were, for, were finally formalized. Uh, it was also a time when Russia was not an aggressive revisionist power, uh, when Russia promised never to invade its neighbors and threaten the independence of its neighboring states, or challenge the 1989 settlement of Europe. Remember those days? 
It was also a time when NATO's substrategic arsenal played more of a political role uh, in the alliance instead of a deterring conflict the way deterrence should. This was the era of the three no's, when NATO promised it, that it had no intentions, no plan, and no reason to deploy its nuclear arsenal on the territory of the new members, and we do not foresee any future need to do so. That was NATO back in 1996. It's difficult to imagine NATO today saying the same thing if Russian armies back in 1996 were redrawing borders, toppling local governments, and threatening the survivability of former Soviet states. Or for that matter, advancing a foreign policy that could threaten the territorial integrity of NATO due to the presence of Russian language speakers in some allied countries. But that was then, so what about today? Well, over the course of a single weekend in Crimea, Russia broke at least six international agreements and treaties. These include some very significant ones, such as the UN Charter, the Helsinki Final Act, the Budapest Memorandum, UN Document A49765, the Russo-Ukrainian Treaty, and of course, the NATO-Russia Founding Act. We can also count additional violations of the OSCE's Vienna Document, the Open Skies Treaty, and very plausibly, the INF Treaty, although that's outside the immediate uh, topic of discussion today. These aren't just any and old treaties, however. These are the documents upon which European peace has been guaranteed for two and a half decades. They had produced the longest stretch of unthreatened peace in Europe since the French Revolution. That peace can no longer be guaranteed. And I think we ignore this change at our peril. Georgia was the first demonstration of Russian revisionism at work. Ukraine is the second. And from a US NATO perspective, the Atlantic community um, fails in its duty to protect Europe if we do not reconsider some of the received wisdom and old assumptions of NATO's bygone era from the 1990s. So what are these old assumptions? First, we had assumed that concepts like extended deterrence were outdated. Second, we'd assumed that keeping a nuclear stockpile was hazardous and ineffective. And actually, we'd reach a time at some point in the future when the world wouldn't need such weapons anymore. Third, we'd assumed that Russia would not act as a strategic competitor. Russia promised us as much in the NATO-Russia Founding Act, along with a promise never to invade neighbors like Ukraine or threaten their independence. But more than a long trail of broken promises, something else has changed. Russia has changed the way in which it thinks about the use of its nuclear arsenal. In 2010, Russia communicated this transition to us through their new military doctrine. Uh, as Russia has told us through this doctrine, uh, Moscow's military planners know that conflicts like the one we're seeing in Ukraine can escalate very quickly, and a conventional fight with an opponent like NATO could result in Russia's first use of nuclear weapons if the Russian state was severely imperiled. Russia has shown us what an operation against NATO would also look like, uh, both in 2009 and again in 2013. These were the largest military exercises held since the end of the Cold War. In 2009, they featured a simulated nuclear strike against America's covenant ally, the Republic of Poland. Um, this is where Russia began to develop what I believe, uh, well, what we've seen is, is more of this concept called this escalate to de-escalate concept. It's built around the idea that the first use of nuclear weapons on a conventional battlefield would stop Western policymakers in their tracks and force us to sue for peace on terms that were beneficial to the Russian state. Now, maybe Russia's right in this calculation. Maybe Russia's wrong. The problem is that Russia is thinking differently about their nuclear weapons, and our approach remains unchanged. In places like Ukraine, Russia is rewriting the security order of Europe before our eyes and injecting into the continent a new level of danger and uncertainty. So if we keep to the old assumptions and we make, I, I fear we make Europe and more broadly the global commons a more dangerous place by not altering our thinking uh, about NATO's substrategic arsenal. So how would keeping to the old ways, the old status quo, uh, be more dangerous? Well, for starters, I believe our failure to respond to a highly aggressive, nuclear armed, revisionist Russia increases the potential for escalation in a conflict rather than diminishing it. Uh, without a rethink, 
NATO's showpiece nuclear arsenal uh, loses its real-world deterrent. Russia also has studied us, I believe, very closely. I'd say that Russian strategists have read us remarkably well. So far, they've uh, correctly predicted how we'd respond to uh, events in Crimea or Eastern Ukraine. It is entirely reasonable, based on our, our reaction so far, that Russian planners can be confident that their escalate to de-escalate strategy would be successful, given our response to date. Putting a real deterrent into extended deterrence would begin to change that calculus. But that's a serious conversation that NATO hasn't really had in decades. So far, the Russians have calculated that success in Ukraine would result if they have a move quick, grab territory, hold territory, and wait for Western political divisions and diplomatic disputes to run their course. I think that calculation has proven to be very accurate. So changing the odds means bolstering NATO's credibility and, more importantly, the credibility of our nuclear deterrent. Now, let's talk about, very briefly, harms and costs. Some might think that a bolstered tactical nuclear deterrent in Central Europe could raise the possibility of a crisis escalating to a strategic exchange. The thinking here is that NATO's substrategic arsenal introduces a new level of risk to our strategic interactions with Russia. Risk and instability, however, are not the same things. While we, ben with the benefit of more substrategic options in Central Europe, national security officials would have greater flexibility and, I believe, more room to slow down the escalation of an unforeseen conflict with Russia. More importantly, I think what happens in Central Europe has more global ramifications, particularly when we look at countries like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Japan. Watching how NATO responds to new threat vectors in this part of the world, Central Europe, new nuclear threat vectors, uh, sends either a radiating concept of, of stability, a, a concept of, of, it communicates to countries that are very worried about the threats they face from their neighbors that NATO and the United States are fully committed to our extended deterrent. Without that level of a strong, visible, and prominent uh, dem uh, demonstration of our nuclear deterrent, I believe we fail in our duty to show that what we have in the United States actually means something, namely a nuclear deterrent. So how do we do this? How do we make NATO's deterrent more deterring to future action? Ultimately, what we want to see is a concept in NATO that evolves after Crimea. That concept would be based on three essential pillars, one that reassures, one that deters, and one that defends against the 21st century threats that none of us expected to contend with, but we're now dealing with today. Uh, increasing reassurance means putting some metal between, uh, behind uh, NATO's uh, ironclad uh, promise to uphold Article 5. Uh, increasing, that would be reassurance. Increasing deterrence means raising the bar for anyone to gamble against NATO in the future. And finally, defending Europe means doing exactly what NATO was designed to do in the first place. This is an alliance that was intended for the territorial defense of, of its member states, and we should be training for just that. Using tried and true communication mechanisms that convey transparency and readiness to Russia, NATO should train for a more robust Article 5 response using all aspects of its capability, including substrategic arms. I'd say, as a result, given the balance of old and new ideas, adamantly yes. The United States should reassess the strategic rationale for not placing NATO's substrategic arms in new NATO states. To do nothing maintains the old status quo in our thinking, and it will make for a far more dangerous world. That is a world that I don't think any of us want to live in. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like you to go ahead and stand up and give your attendance speech, and then we'll have a good classics. <clears throat> Well, I want to echo Peter's thanks to CSIS for the invitation to debate this vitally important topic today. And I just want to start by saying that Russia's annexation of Crimea and continued threats to eastern Ukraine are unequivocal violations of Ukraine's sovereignty and international agreements that have been the backbone of stability in Europe. Russia should face and is facing political and economic consequences for its actions until it ceases its aggression. In addition, the United States and Europe should take steps to support the new Ukrainian government 
and reassure allied governments in the states of the easternmost NATO members. Regarding Central and Eastern Europe, NATO should reinforce defensive capabilities in the region and strengthen deterrence to ensure that no NATO member suffers the same fate as Ukraine. Peter and I are in violent agreement on these larger objectives. The question is what means are likely to be most effective in securing these ends. And we strongly and fundamentally disagree on the wisdom of deploying tactical nuclear warheads and their associated dual capable aircraft on the territory of the NATO members that border Russia. In my view, such a radical step would be ineffective, provocative, divisive, expensive, and counterproductive. For starters, the main Russian threat to Central and Eastern Europe is not nuclear. It's no accident that the approximately 2,100 deployed strategic and non-strategic nuclear weapons possessed by the United States did not deter Russian land grabbing in Ukraine. As Peter and his colleagues wrote in their March 25th SEPA analysis, which I commend to everyone here, quote, Article 5 and the U.S.-U.K. nuclear umbrella are ill-suited to dealing with Crimea-style tactics, which are localized, low intensity, and quick. These tactics fall below the threshold that makes threatening or using nuclear weapons rational or credible. Despite Russia's annexation of Crimea, there is no indication that there is an imminent Russian threat against NATO territory. In the unlikely event Russia were to make a large-scale conventional move against NATO, U.S. and NATO conventional forces are capable of responding. More specifically, moving tactical nuclear weapons eastward would be ineffective because the roughly 180 non-strategic B-61s already deployed in Europe are militarily useless and don't strengthen deterrence. When asked in 2010 if there is a military mission performed by U.S. tactical nuclear weapons in Europe that cannot be performed by either U.S. strategic or conventional forces, General James Cartwright, then Vice Chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, flatly said no. One senior official with European Command told a task force created by the Defense Secretary that we, quote, pay a king's ransom for these things, tactical nuclear weapons in Europe, and they have no military value, unquote. If there were an increased Russian imminent threat against NATO territory, the last place NATO military planners would want to move U.S. nuclear weapons would probably, closer, would probably be closer to that threat. Our nuclear forces do provide reassurance to our allies by extending deterrence, but the heavy lifting of extended deterrence is done by our central strategic forces based in the United States and under the oceans, not forward deployed tactical nuclear weapons in Europe. Even then, nuclear weapons are just one piece of the assurance puzzle. Our resolve to protect our Central European NATO allies against potential Russian aggression is demonstrated first and foremost through our political commitments under NATO. If, if allies question our resolve, more nuclear capabilities won't reverse the perception that our commitment is weak. In the current crisis over Ukraine, the calls for, from Eastern European allies for reassurance has been for non-nuclear measures, such as increased air patrols, naval deployments and exercises, airlift deployment of paratrooper regiments, and development of new contingency plans. The allies are interested in visible signs of the Article 5 commitment, particularly boots on the ground, which act as a tripwire against any incursion. Most importantly, using tactical nuclear weapons to reassure Eastern European allies is dubious for the simple th reason that they are the least likely weapons to be used against any of the realistic security threats that Eastern European allies face today. It would serve those allies and NATO better if they focused on providing non-nuclear assurances that are symmetrical and credible. Examining an Eastern move for U.S. nuclear weapons in Europe would also be divisive, threatening alliance co cohesion at a time when cohesion is vitally important. The 1997 NATO-Russia Founding Act stated that NATO had, quote, no intention, no plan, and no reason to deploy nuclear weapons on the territory of new member states, and that the alliance will carry out its collective defense and other missions without additional permanent stationing of substantial combat troops. Despite Russia's aggression against Ukraine, the deployment of tactical nuclear weapons in additional countries in Europe is almost certainly a political bridge too far, especially for the countries in the western part of the alliance. Such a conversation would also divert attention away from more realistic and effective steps to counter Russia and support ally. Indeed, NATO's existing nuclear posture is divisive, as I'll discuss at the end of my statement. 
Deploying tactical nuclear weapons eastward would also be divisive because it would be extremely pr provocative. In response, Russia might remove some of its offensive non-strategic warheads from central storage and mate them with delivery systems closer to NATO borders, for example, in the, in the Kaliningrad region bordering Poland. How would triggering such a counteraction help pressure Eastern, help reassure, excuse me, Eastern NATO allies? In addition, building the sites necessary to house, store, and secure B-61s and dual-capable aircraft wouldn't be cheap. At a time when U.S. and NATO defense spending is at a premium, every dollar spent on nuclear weapons is a dollar that can't be spent to provide Central and Eastern NATO allies with the additional conventional military support that is more relevant to their predicament. For all these reasons, deploying tactical nuclear weapons eastward would be counterproductive and is the wrong response to Russians' aggression in Ukraine. There is no benefit in trying to increase the relevance of nuclear weapons to this crisis. Our goal should be to try to de-escalate de the crisis, not escalate it further via nuclear competition. The current security environment in Europe does, however, raise an interesting question about the future of the existing U.S. tactical nuclear weapons already deployed in Europe. Some observers, including advocates of unilaterally removing U.S. nuclear weapons from Europe, are now saying that the debate over withdrawal is over for the time being. Let me make four observations about this. First, despite the current tensions, the current NATO nuclear posture, nuclear posture status quo remains untenable. The complete withdrawal of U.S. nuclear weapons from Europe over the next decade by political and financial default is still a distinct possibility. It is far from clear that the five NATO host nations will take the necessary steps to upgrade their aging dual-capable aircraft. For many of the reasons I've already highlighted, moving dual-capable aircraft and weapons eastward is not a realistic solution to this problem. Second, NATO's nuclear posture remains divisive within the alliance. The recent reaffirmations of the continued forward deployment of U.S. tactical nuclear weapons reflects the lowest common denominator, not consensus. Third, nuclear burden sharing is increasingly a misnomer. One of the main justifications for keeping tactical weapons in Europe is that transatlantic ties are strengthened when the risks and costs of deploying and securing nuclear weapons are shared between the United States and the respective host nations. However, the 2008 final report of the Air Force Blue Ribbon Review of Nuclear Weapons Policies and Procedures concluded that host nation security at, quote, most sites in Europe where U.S. nuclear weapons are deployed do not meet the Defense Department's security requirements. An alarming illustration of these shortcomings occurred in 2010 when a group of Belgian peace activists penetrated the airbase believed to house 20 U.S. B-61 nuclear weapons. Although some European military officials still strongly report the still strongly support the retention of tactical nuclear weapons, political leaders in the host nations do not place a high priority on the nuclear mission and thus do not make a strong public case for the resources necessary to sustain the mission. Fourth, beyond security and political considerations, the financial costs of continuing the European nuclear deployment are growing, just as budget austerity is putting pressure on defense spending in Washington and continuing to put pressure on NATO military expenditures. The B-61 Life Extension Program, which could end up costing $12 billion, is leaching resources from higher priority defense and national security programs. Last year, congressional appropriators zeroed out the Pentagon's request to make the F-35A nuclear capable, raising the possibility that the refurbished B-61 slated to be deployed in Europe may not have aircraft to deliver them after the existing European dual-capable aircraft are retired over the next decade. Former Air, For Air Force Chief of Staff General Norton Schwartz recently argued that the Pentagon should forgo making the F-35 nuclear capable and instead prioritize a nuclear capability for the long-range strike bomber program. Might the current cri Ukraine crisis change these dynamics? Perhaps. But in my view, the clock is ticking, and the sooner we stop relying on the forward-deployed weapons as a crutch and begin the difficult conversation about security and reassurance and the absence of these weapons, the better off we and our allies will be. Thank you, and I look forward to the rest of the debate. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, each of them will have <clears throat> five minutes to ask questions of the other one.
and start thinking of your own questions. So you get to go first. Okay, thank you very much. King said great comments. Uh, I really appreciated them. I, I, I think there were a lot of valid points made. I also think that this would have been a great conversation to be having along the lines of those, one second. It would have been a great conversation to have along those lines in 2010. What's weird about this is that we're having this conversation today in 2014. Um, there were a lot of assumptions embedded in that uh, a very masterful uh, tour of the table uh, of where we are with substrategic arms. Um, I think I'd isolate four, maybe four and a half. First, treaties. Uh, there's a, a lot of embedded assumptions that the Russians would keep their treaty obligations. We've seen over the course of the last few months a string of violations, and it's, in my view, hard to assess Russia's intentions to keep to promises it makes. If Russia can't keep treaties and won't keep treaties, how do we approach this question of proliferation and the use of, of substrategic arms on their part in the event of a crisis? I point that out because that's, our, that's the second question I might have. What would you say to a, a country like Poland that is very close uh, to, to Russia, uh, that faces the very real uh, possibility of escalation uh, from the Russians, uh, that there could be a conflict at some point in North Central Europe that could uh, escalate very quickly. Uh, so what would you say to, to a country like Poland, uh, a covenant ally, ally like Poland, who doesn't have the benefit of being protected by two large oceans, being physically removed from this, uh, how do you reassure allies that we are credible and they can take us seriously when we say our extended deterrence is real and we will use it to defend you? Um, another issue is this question of escalation. Uh, one of the fundamental gaps we have when we start thinking about removing NATO's uh, substrategic arsenal is that we, we limit ourselves in a very important way. Uh, I mean this to say, instead of going from zero to 100, we insert a mezzanine level of escalation through substrategic options uh, that prevents a conventional conflict from escalating very quickly and turning into a strategic exchange. So now that Russia has turned down the president in his offer to negotiate uh, a drawdown of Russian tactical nuclear weapons, and we have very little indication to believe the Russians are willing to keep to any treaties they might make. My second, my th second question is... I'm actually going to stop today and let him answer your first set oh, of questions. Great. So those are two. How would you reassure Pol Poland? And how do we approach Russia that really doesn't give us much options for, for negotiation? Sure. Well, on the first question, I mean, you raise some very important points about how in the face of Russian revanchism um, over the past uh, few months, but, but even, even prior to that, you mentioned Georgia in 2008, um, how do we reassure Poland of NATO's um, and the U.S. commitment to their security? And I think that's a vitally important question. And I listed a number of non-nuclear means of reassurance that I believe are more credible, uh, more relevant to the security situation that Poland finds itself, finds itself in than placing greater emphasis on archaic, forward-deployed, non-strategic nuclear weapons, which I believe have no military value. And in the event of an actual shooting war with the Russians, these weapons could actually be be a target, and they'd be the last weapons that, that, that we would, would actually use. So I think there is space for and a need for important um, investments, symmetrical investments, proportional investments to, um, to, what, uh, to what the Poles face, cyber defense, um, command and control, uh, interoperability, uh, ISR. Uh, NATO ran out of, how quickly did NATO run out of precision-guided munitions uh, in the conflict? Uh, with Libya before they had to come to the U.S. to ask for more. I mean, these are the kinds of investments that I would be making while at the same time um, continuing to express through conventional military cooperation, through tying um, Poland's security more closely to ours, um, that, uh, that we will make good on our Article 5 commitments. Time for one more question. One more question. Um, when what happens when this fails? What happens when uh, all of these ideas and concepts that we've built up on our, our old assumptions uh, prove wrong? What happens when there is a conflict that escalates quickly and our options for escalation go from conventional to strategic very, very rapidly? 
Um, how, how do we respond in the event that, that these ideas could be out of date, these ideas could be wrong? How, how do we retread the alliance uh, to be more versatile and effective uh, if, if, if none of these assumptions hold, hold water in the end? So I've done study in the past about this um, idea that the differing yields of nuclear weapons can create um, flexibility and provide different options to the U.S. president or to NATO um, in the event uh, um, deterrence fails or seems like it's going to fail. And I have yet to, to be convinced that the use of lower yield weapons or, or sub-strategic weapons as a way to enhance deterrence and attempt to control escal escalation won't result um, in a response by the potential adversary that, um, that is, is worse than, um, than, the initial, than the initial move. Um, I think that substrategic weapons, low yield nuclear weapons, don't offer an escape from the reality that nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. So I don't believe that these substrategic weapons give us meaningful um, additional options that uh, strategic weapons centrally based in the United States um, or um, conventional means can't, um, can't fill. Okay, now you have five minutes to ask him questions. Sure. So I guess my first question um, for you, Peter, you talked a lot about how th the world has changed, how the security environment in, in Europe has changed, but at the same time, I, I heard more about how relying more on substrategic weapons would um, enhance deterrence um, and enhance reassurance. I mean, first of all, if you heard from any of our Eastern European allies that um, moving substrategic nuclear weapons eastward is something that they would like to see. I think the answer would be yes. I think that if you ask uh, Poland uh, or some of the other NATO member states if they would be willing to begin this discussion in the context of uh, a NATO conversation, uh, I think the answer would be very receptive. I think ultimately the problem we face is that these ideas are old. Uh, we have allies that are looking at two options. Either they radiate stability through the confidence that extended deterrence gives them or they will ingest increasingly toxic levels of instability uh, from NATO's eastern frontier. Uh, so if we began this discussion inside a NATO context and simply began to reassess the options and assumptions that we once made and compare them against reality, I think that NATO's newest member states would be very willing to have that conversation about uh, the old and 1990s era assumptions that, that we've been working off of all along. So another question I would have for you is that uh, the U.S. no longer relies on, on non-strategic nuclear weapons in the Asia-Pacific. Uh, we have removed all of our sub-strategic weapons from that theater uh, in the midst of um, some rather unsettling North Korean saber rattling last March, um, about the, uh, in the midst of some military exercises about um, potential <coughs> nuclear strikes against South Korea and the United States. The U.S. took several steps um, to help to reassure um, uh, South Korea and other allies in the region, including flying two um, um, B-52 bombers from the United States um, over, um, over the Korean Peninsula or near the Korean Peninsula. So if we can maintain um, extended deterrence and reassurance in, um, in the Asia Pacific without tactical nuclear weapons, um, why, why do we have to have them um, in Europe? Sure. Ultimately, we're getting at the fundamental problem with, with uh, what, we're, what we're seeing in Central Europe. Right now, we risk higher levels of proliferation, not from rogue states, but for tradi from traditional allies and partners. Uh, countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, the UAE, even Japan are watching what's happening in Central Europe very closely and they're making calculations on, about their own security and own nuclear options based on how credible they perceive the U.S. deterrent to be. Our fundamental problem is that if we don't effectively reassure allies through a robust, strong, and prominent demonstration of America's commitment 
to extended deterrence in Europe. Uh, we can find increasingly difficult, uh, we can find it increasingly difficult to deter aggression from other states elsewhere in the Middle East and Asia. And I think the solution to that is to maintain uh, a strong and robust tactical option, that mezzanine option in any escalation scenario in Europe, uh, as a way of showing that we're serious, we're going to use the big guns in the event that your security is threatened. Uh, that's speaking to NATO, but other allies in different parts of the world will take that cue very seriously and they'll ingest it and they'll find cause to be more confident in America's extended deterrent rather than insecure. And then final question, if there's still time, I guess just about a minute. Um, given, given some of the financial costs associated with um, not only just sustaining and modernizing the existing tactical nuclear weapons in Europe, but also the additional costs that it would accrue from moving them eastward, um, why is it, why would it be more productive to spend that money on tactical nuclear weapons as opposed to non-nuclear uh, conventional means of reassurance that would be more relevant to the types of threats that um, our Eastern European allies are currently facing? Well, I think you can disaggregate the nuclear threat from the conventional threat that, that Central European allies face. Uh, we know this because of Russia's escalate to de-escalate thinking. Uh, again, this would, sh this would anticipate a rapid escalation of a conventional conflict into, a nuclear, uh, into the first use on Russia's part of a nuclear weapon. When it comes to cost, I can't think of any higher priority right now in the world. Uh, than the active revisionist nuclear-tipped power uh, that Russia is at this point, uh, a Russia that refuses to abide by the international uh, security order, specifically in Europe, uh, a Russia that seems willing to break the peace that has, that has been established over the past two and a half uh, decades. If the costs of maintaining security in Europe are too high, then the United States needs to get out of the security business. I don't think we're at that point yet. In fact, I think the world would be far more instable, uh, far less predictable, and far more dangerous uh, if we abandoned the traditional role of extended deterrence to our allies in uh, not just Europe, but elsewhere in the world. Okay, okay thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take the prerogative to ask <clears throat> a couple questions of both of you. Um, to try to parse out some of the things I think are underlying this discussion. The first is, um, if I understand correctly, you said that we should just remove tactical nuclear weapons entirely over some point in time from Europe, um, and you think that we should put them farther to the east. So my question is, could, I, could both of you talk about um, what you believe Russia's reaction would be, either to removal or to, to more forward deployment? We sort of, I think, talked about that obliquely, but what do you think how would Russia perceive it, and then what do you think Russia would do in response to either of those moves? Um, let me start first um, at the outside by saying I don't believe that the political conditions are particularly conducive to uh, the withdrawal of tactical nuclear weapons, U.S. tactical nuclear weapons from Europe right now. At the same time, I, th I think we need to look at the long term. I think we have to look past just the crisis um, of, of the moment and look at some of the current political and financial trends um, in Europe and um, attempt to get out ahead of what I think is, is a, a slow-moving process of disarmament by default. Um, just one example of why I think that's the case. Uh, the, the Germans um, are currently procuring the Eurofighter, which will be their next generation aircraft to replace the dual-capable Tornado. Uh, the Eurofighter is not going to be wired for a nuclear capability, and in order for the, um, in order to give the Eurofighter the avionics package that would be necessary to deliver nuclear weapons, that's an expenditure that the that the German Parliament would have to remove, and I'm not particularly com uh, confident that the German Parliament would do that. And if the Germans get out of the nuclear business, I think the Belgians and Dutch wouldn't be far behind, um, leaving just the, the Italians and the Turks. And if the three northern members got out of the business, um, I don't think the Italians would be too far behind. So I worry that unless we get out, get out ahead of the problem, that, um, that, we, that the removal of these nuclear weapons could, could happen um, uh, by default amidst reclamations amidst uh, alliance disunity and, and, and fracturing. So how would Russia respond? I mean, I don't think this, this uh, decision about our forward deployed tactical nuclear weapons should be contingent on how Russia feels. I mean, Russia has thousands of, of tactical nuclear weapons. Um, do our, 
tactical nuclear weapons provide them with, with an excuse not to, um, uh, not to engage more seriously on tactical nuclear weapons, sure. But they have t tactical nuclear weapons for their own security re reasons, irrespective of just the, the weapons that we, um, that we have in Europe. So ultimately, it's about what's in the best interests of, of NATO financially um, and, and politically, and less about um, what the Russians would, would say or do. On that point, I think we, we, we very much agree. Uh, regarding uh, how, how would Russia respond, I, th I think that uh, we should take the long view. I think you're right. But in that long view, the genie, the nuclear genie is out of the bottle. Kingston, if you and I could wave a magic wand and achieve Ronald Reagan and uh, Barack Obama's vision for a world without nuclear weapons, that would be great, except the first six months of a conventional war between two states would see their reintroduction near, almost immediately. Uh, this is technology and a capability that if you have the right uh, scientists and equipment and, and if you have the right means, uh, new, conventional war in a world without nuclear weapons, but knowledge of them, would eventually escalate back to uh, where we are today, if not worse. Uh, when it comes to the deployment, uh, Germany and the Netherlands, these used to be NATO frontline states. There was nothing about NATO that said we have to keep our nuclear arsenal back away from Russia. Uh, the new frontline states are Poland, the Baltic states, that eastern flank from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. Uh, so I think there's a compelling strategic rationale to uh, appropriate these weapons to, to places where they might be needed. And finally, when it comes to Russia's uh, response to a move like this, it's not escalatory because it in no way endangers Russia's first or second strike capability. We will maintain nuclear stability in the balance between Russia and the United States. If Russia's first and second strike capability are in no way uh, impinged upon, then I, I don't think that we, we have cause for, for some worst case scenario concerns. Um, and my last question, and this is more taking a baseline reading. Um, there's been a lot of discuss discussion recently, especially after um, the sort of red line in Syria that was not about the credibility of U.S. threats. What do you think right now is the credibility, NATO's, the credibility of U.S. nuclear weapons in NATO? Do you believe that NATO countries believe that the U.S. would use a tactical nuclear weapon if Russia crossed a particular threshold? I'll take that one first. Ultimately, I think that's the problem we're dealing with, is, is this credibility of our extended deterrent. Uh, when it comes to would NATO use its sub-strategic options, and by the way, we're really speaking about the United States releasing these weapons for NATO's use in that environment. Uh, I, I think that's the real problem we face. Russia, as I said before, it has read us extremely well. Russian planners understand the kind of security environment they face. They've developed a strategy that is ideally suited to exploit that permissive security environment. Their idea is that the sign of a, the, use, the first use of a nuclear weapon in a conventional conflict in North, let's say, North Central Europe uh, would give us pause and force political leaders to sue for peace on their terms. I think that's the danger we face at the end of the day. NATO's nuclear deterrent must not be a prestige um, museum piece that we pull out and look at and say, wow, that's great. It needs to be a real world deterrent that prevents conflicts from happening in the first place uh, and isn't necessarily, we should stop thinking about it in terms of eye for an eye. So, first of all, um, regarding the issue of, of, of red lines and uh, is the U.S., um, how the U.S. Uh, responded or didn't respond in Syria, um, how the U.S. has responded or hasn't responded in U Ukraine. I mean, there's a fundamentally different situation given the NATO Article 5 commitment. And we should look at the steps that the United, taking, United States is taking to support our Central European and Eastern European allies to help um, buttress their defenses um, and to help uh, in, enhance deterrence um, in, the, in the conventional sp sphere. So that's point number one. Point number two, um, in terms of whether or not our NATO allies believe we'd use um, our tactical um, nuclear weapons, well, first of all, you'd have to ask them because they're going to be involved um, in a decision on whether or not these weapons are actually going to be used. And I don't think their, their credibility or lack of credibility has anything to do with you know, what may have happened or in Syria or perceptions about um, U.S. Uh, U.S. resolve, I just don't believe the weapons are credible in this content, context. Like General Cartwright, uh, 
I don't believe they have any military utility that can't be performed by um, U.S. conventional forces or, if necessary, U.S. strategic forces based in the United States. Um, and I talked a little bit earlier about I don't, I don't believe that the, that the lower yield that these, that these weapons uh, apparently have gives us any real meaningful options or additional flexibility. Great. Um, now it's time for your questions. Just a couple ground rules. If you'd wait for the microphone, please. Um, even if you have a loud, booming voice, that way the internet will pick you up too. Um, let us know who you are and where you're from, and um, if you're addressing your question to one of the speakers or both. Um, and again, if anyone's watching online, you'll see the email to email your questions to at the bottom of your screen. Shoot them to me, and I'll read them for you. Um, so we'll open up for questions now. Yes. I do have a microphone, thank you. Um, I appreciate both sides of the argument here. Uh, I'm from the Luger Center, Alan Maggard from the Luger Center, excuse me, I'm new on this. Um, but I'd like to get both sides' opinions on uh, recent developments within, the, our, uh, within our Congress regarding the development of a European phased adaptive approach to uh, missile defense. Um, I would specifically like to know um, the political ramifications as it applies in terms of international relations. Uh, I know that's a very broad question, but um, it's something that seems very sensitive and at least pertinent to our current topic. Thank you. I'll take, uh, I'll take the lead on sure. that. When we talk about reassuring, deterring, and defending NATO against the, the kinds of threats we now realize we're going to be facing in the 21st century, uh, and in the context of EPAA, this would be uh, NATO's missile defense uh, approach to missile defense. Uh, it's first and foremost absolutely necessary to say uh, NATO's, uh, and by extension, the U.S. EPAA, the European Phased Adapted Approach to Missile Defense, does not impede Russia's strategic deterrent to us. It maintains nuclear stability in Europe. There is no threat to Russia's first or second strike. Uh, there is no need to be worried about an, a nuclear escalation as a result of EPAA. More importantly, if NATO starts thinking about fulfilling its own pledge that it's made now at two successive NATO summits uh, to provide for the uh, to provide for the missile defense of all European NATO states, uh, we have to start looking more uh, actively at, at uh, lower and mid-tier. This would be different from EPAA, which is upper tier. Uh, lower and mid-tier air and missile defenses that protect countries like Poland and the Baltic states from the real threat they face, not from strategic nuclear arms, but from theater ballistic missiles. This is a technology that's proven, we know it works, and the United States has become very efficient at protecting countries through this defensive uh, weapons uh, system, a defensive system that in no way impedes Russia's first or second strike. So I don't see any, any complications uh, as in the context of air and missile defense uh, from either EPA or for, uh, lower and mid-tier air and missile defense. Let me just say that I agree a lot of what, what um, Peter said. In fact, I'd be opening to considering rotating a Patriot battery, um, which we've done before in Pol Poland, or a THAAD um, battery there. Um, in relation to the EPA, however, and uh, the, the, the current Ukraine crisis, um, uh, let me just say there's some in Congress saying that in response to Russian aggression against Ukraine, we should accelerate implementation of the phased adaptive approach, particularly phase three, which is going to see the deployment of SM2, um, SM-32A um, Aegis Ashore missiles um, on, on the territory of Poland. And I would just say first that the AP, EPA is not dis designed to respond to the potential, is, is designed to respond to a potential missile threat from the Middle East, not the threat from Russia. And the only apparent goal of an accelerated timetable is to upset Russia, which, which as Peter got into, um, opposes the system. And despite our current tensions with Russia, it's still in the U.S. national interest, in my view, not to feed the Russian sus suspicion that the EPAA is directed at them, an impression we have been spending years to try and dispel. Um, and moreover, it's not exactly clear what the, what the, um, the system would be defending against, um, the SM-32A, would, would have capability against intermediate range missiles um, and perhaps longer range missiles um, since the Pentagon says 
as Peter noted, it would be useless against uh, Russia's strategic forces. Chair so everyone can hear, you've asked about whether or not the EPA or a perception that it's flexible to deal with other threats that arise, not just the one yeah, it was built for. Yeah, yeah. Um, so are you talking about vis-a-vis -vis Russia and not Iran? I'm, I'm talking vis-a-vis -vis in general, uh, not necessarily towards Iran or towards Russia. But there are certain clauses akin to just the facto. Ultimately, the problem is eight and a half seconds. Eight and a half seconds is about how is how uh, is the gap between a strategic launch from Western Ukraine, uh, it's not Western Ukraine, excuse me, Western Russia, uh, uh, launched towards the United States, launched towards the American homeland by a Russian uh, by by Russia in this unwanted and uh, arguably low probability scenario. Uh, eight and a half seconds is the gap uh, that exists between uh, that Russian ICBM and the fastest that an SM3 based in Poland can reach it. Uh, because of that gap, uh, this is simply geography, uh, because of that gap, uh, Russia's uh, first strike uh, would get through. Uh, Russia does not have any cause to be concerned, um, and it sounds strange to say in a context here in Washington, uh, doesn't have any cause to be concerned about its strategic deterrent being upended in any way by EPAA uh, being, um, the European phased adapted approach being uh, deployed in Poland. More importantly, this does more than, than just uh, uh, protect European NATO from uh, ballistic missile threats, uh, but it also does an important thing by conveying, again, that reassurance to allies. We want allies that radiate stability, that don't ingest ingest toxic instability, as I said before. Uh, when it comes to rotating uh, a Patriot battery, yep, absolutely. This is an idea that has been put forward. Importantly, that Patriot battery must be armed and active. When we rotated the Patriot previously, it was an empty training unit. Uh, it said, empty, spray painted on the side of the Patriot battery. This did not send the kind of reassuring message that the United States should be sending to its allies, given the kinds of threats that these countries now face. So I think when we assess the preponderance of Russia's strategic deterrent is not threatened, nuclear stability remains, allies are stronger and bolstered by American, pre America's presence in their countries, and we can protect against not just one, but different kinds of threats uh, that Europe faces in the 21st century. I think the answer on that front is compellingly yes. And I, I just would add, yes, the Aegis Missile Defense System would have capability against um, ballistic missiles of, of other countries, and the system is deployed in, in other parts of the world. But as it pertains to the EPAA, the purpose of that system should remain focused on the um, ballistic missile threat from Iran. Could I take that yeah, we're going to cut you off. Sorry. Yep, we're going to move on to someone else. Thanks. Um, up here. I'm uh, Holly Ryan, founder and CEO of Veritas Alchemy LLC. Um, I'm actually in the midst of a publication that speaks specifically to the issue of the military utility of employing tactical nuclear weapons, so I can certainly see um, the side of your argument, um, Mr. Reef. My issue is, um, I think, something that we can all agree upon, and that is that, um, you know, for over a decade now, our operational and tactical focus has been on counterterrorism and counterinsurgency. Um, and I guess the question I would ask is, do you think that Russia assumes that NATO, and in particular the United States, is not prepared to fight a conventional war? And if that's the case, then would not perhaps the interim positioning of tactical nu nuclear weapons or extension of those um, weapons not at least buy time or provide a buffer uh, so that NATO and the U.S. in particular 
can invest in preparing for and directing resources at developing a more conventional capability? I'll start with that, Peter, and then if you want to weigh in. Um, I think the Russians calculated, probably rightly, that the United States and NATO weren't willing to fight uh, conventional war over Ukraine, but a conventional war over NATO is a totally, totally different story. Um, so if the Russians were to make a major conventional move against a, a NATO member, um, I think we would be compelled to act, and we would, and we would act, um, because the, the credibility of the alliance would, would be at stake. So I think the Russians would be making um, a hugely unwise gamble if they were to if they were do that. Now, people have talked about um, less um, uh, forward threats, if you will, to, to the Baltic states, for example, and how they could use similar the Russians could use similar tactics that were used um, in Crimea to foment dissent against some of the Russian minorities in, in the Baltic states and attempt to destabilize them in, in that fashion. But again, I don't see how tactical nuclear weapons are relevant at all to either deterring that threat or potentially responding to that, to that threat. Um, so, I mean, I would rush rather spend my dollars in the uh, scarce defense resource in the Baltic states on things like um, cyber defense, for example, um, as opposed to weapons that, that aren't going to deter the kind of um, low-level meddling. And in the event there were a major conventional attack, uh, the United States and NATO are more than capable of responding with, with conventional forces, which greatly exceed those of the Russians. Um. Two points in response. First, uh, our steps so far in the immediate aftermath of Crimea have been very temporary. These steps uh, are temporary because we signed the NATO-Russia Founding Act saying that we would not make permanent deployments in new NATO members. The problem with the current uh, structure as, as it has unfolded is that easy in, easy out, our troops can move just as easily in as they, we can pull them easily out, uh, is very unsettling to countries that are looking for signs of reassurance from the United States. Here in the United States, we Americans go to bed every night knowing that we are protected by one of the most robust and capable extended deterrents on the planet. The problem is that our allies in Eastern and Central Europe, uh, they don't have that same sense of security. They they do question, uh, not that NATO will come. I think a lot of them realize that in the event of a crisis, a conventional crisis, NATO will come. The question that, that they face and that their security planners are grappling with is what's left of their country when NATO finally arrives? How long does it take NATO to politically release the use of combat brigade uh, teams uh, for the defense of Central Europe? And I think that's really what we're going to be addressing here. NATO, uh, uh, a strong, prominent, and very visible demonstration of America's commitment to NATO's sub-strategic arsenal and the extended deterrence it conveys allows our allies in Central Europe to not pursue alternate strategies, hedging strategies, worst case strategies, strategies that might be more destabilizing. And secondly, if we have a global context here, other countries in different parts of the world are watching what's happening. Uh, and they're watching to see that what, how America protects its covenant allies. Uh, they're, they're, they're watching to see that that level of protection through our extended deterrence could be as credible to them as it is in NATO. If America's substrategic nuclear deterrent is not credible in NATO, in a NATO context, uh, countries in the Middle East and Asia have very deep cause to be concerned. I want to avoid that. I want to prevent that level of proliferation, that risk of proliferation. And I think if we re-examine some of the fundamental originating assumptions that we've based our basing and nuclear uh, posture on in Europe, we can avoid those worst case outcomes elsewhere. Clark, do you have a question? Thank you. I have a question for, for both speakers. Um, a related question, not exactly on point. Uh, the track record of countries possessing nuclear weapons or having U.S. weapons deployed on their territory for avoiding invasions and avoiding conquests and avoiding occupations is quite good, with the exception of Israel and its undeclared capabilities, 
None of these nations have even suffered major conventional attacks. In that light, perhaps Ukraine is having very serious second thoughts about having given up its nuclear weapons. Well, there's no perhaps about it. Ukraine has. In fact, this has become an issue in their uh, current presidential election. Remember, based on promises that Russia made never to invade Ukraine, never to threaten their sovereignty or in any way impede upon their independence, Ukraine uh, gave up the inherited Soviet nuclear arsenal that it possessed. Ukrainians are now asking themselves, why did we do that? And maybe we should go back on that agreement. This is a very dangerous conversation to even watch uh, take place in Ukraine. It speaks to a level of insecurity uh, that not just Ukrainians but other countries face. We don't want the message to be, you can't rely on the United States, you must rely only on your own national strategic deterrent. If that message is what everyone takes away from Crimea, we risk a level of proliferation unlike any we've seen before. I think that the best way to address that issue is to reassess the underlying assumptions that we made early on and to show that no, America's extended deterrent is credible for a real world setting and countries don't have to rely, countries that do not currently possess nuclear weapons don't have to begin pursuing them or find insurance policies against the event that America reneges on its promises to allies. It's a great question, Clark, one that's been hotly debated not only in Ukraine, but um, among the, the expert community here in D.C. as well. Um, setting aside for the moment the question of whether Ukrainian nuclear weapons would have prevented uh, Russia's uh, land grab in Crimea and continued efforts to destabilize the rest of U Ukraine, um, I think we have to go back to uh, the end of the Soviet Union and address the question of um, could the Ukrainians have maintained a nuclear arsenal financially? I <laughs> oh, I know, but it's relevant. <laughs> but it's, it's a relevant. question he's going to answer. It's relevant, and at the same time, um, uh, you know, at what cost to do so? Um, and I think there are uh, large questions about whether that would have been feasible. Now, to get to your question, I think this is one of the reasons that we have to strongly respond to uh, Russia's aggression uh, against Ukraine and support our allies, because if security assurances are going to mean anything as a tool going forward, um, I think it is important to demonstrate that um, that we're going to respond to what Russia is doing. Now, the 1994 Budapest Memorandum was not an ironclad, legally binding military commitment, and it was written that way for specific purposes, but we, because we weren't ready to offer such a commitment. But at the same time, if we were to do nothing and there were to be no response, I think it would have significant negative consequences for uh, non-proliferation more generally. Um, I'm going to ask a question from someone who emailed in. This is from Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel Kurt, and I apologize if you're still watching, Shen Dizelos, U.S. Air Force National Defense Fellow and Visiting Scholar at the Center for International Studies and Cooperation at Stanford. This is a question for you, although I'll give you a chance to chime in if you want. He asks, given that Russia well understands U.S. and NATO nuclear capabilities to date, why would forward deploying tactical nuclear weapons help change the Russian calculations? What is different about a B-61 delivered by a fighter originating from a base in Italy or Poland versus delivered from a bomber or SLBM originating outside of Russia? Right. Twofold. One, I think having more options uh, in the region in the event of an unforeseen uh, international security crisis uh, is beneficial to decision makers. Uh, I think it, it decreases the uh, the uh, it 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 decreases the geographic gap that would exist from say deploying a substrategic uh, weapon from say the United States all the way uh, to North Central Europe. And I also think it it speaks to the larger issue. We have allies that see our responses that welcome our responses. But they're at the same time very concerned that these are short-term fixes and the United States is not truly committed to upholding its Article 5 commitments. Worse, uh, 
they, they're worried they, they might not live to see the time when in the event of a crisis and they are in a war and Russia does utilize that escalate to de-escalate strategy, they're worried that many of their uh, political elites and decision makers won't be al alive to see NATO come to their assistance. We can address that concern immediately by showing that NATO's credible and prominent substrategic deterrent is viable for a Central European context. Anything you want to add? I would just say I agree with the premise of the question. <laughs> um, we have time for one more quick question and, and quick answer. Sam, you had a question? Okay. Um, let's go back here. I think that you're going to... Richard. Uh, Richard White, Hudson Institute. A lot of what uh, we know about Russia's tactical nuclear uh, weapons doctrine comes from when they were more talkative about this in, at the, you know, in the 1990s. Um, I have not heard that they've renounced this escalate to de-escalate uh, theory, but I've actually not seen much evidence in the last few years that, that anyone's, that they're actually propounding that. So I was curious if you've actually seen evidence that they still believe that, or it's just because, I, or are we just assuming that because they haven't formally renounced it as they renounced their first use doctrine that, they, that they're continuing it? Okay. Okay. To answer the question, let's put ourselves in the minds of a Central European national security planning team. We are tasked with the protection of our own citizens on the front line of NATO. When we have to uphold that task, we have to be very realistic and um, we can't be impeded by political uh, restrictions in how we protect our own citizens. We could look at the, that security dilemma from the United States' perspective and say, well, you know, we, we can't see examples here or, or we are reassured there, but that's the U.S. perspective. The problem that we face in a NATO context is that Central European national security planners are increasingly concerned that existing deterrents uh, to that escalation in the event of a crisis aren't enough and that, as the Russians themselves have identified, small-scale conflicts can quickly accelerate into larger wars, and those wars can go nuclear very rapidly. Uh, so if we're Central European national security planners, and we're tasked with protecting our own citizens, we have to be very real in addressing those threats. One way in which we'd like to see NATO address those threats, I'd imagine would be to have a, a visible and obvious demonstration of America's commitment, uh, and that would be uh, best held in the context of NATO rethinking some of those original assumptions uh, that it uh, made back about 20 years ago and reassessing how those original assumptions apply today. Uh, those assumptions would be rethought in the context of a country that crosses international borders, violates the sovereignty of its neighbors, and is very eager to revise the post-1989 settlement of Europe. This is a reality that we can't ignore and we can't take comfort in because Again, we're on the front lines uh, in the mindset of a Central European uh, national security planner. I think when we start thinking about it in those terms, uh, the comfort that we feel in the United States falls away. We see the world through our NATO allies' point of view, and we can do everything from a U.S. perspective in our power to ensure that they don't start pursuing uh, options that include robust conventional uh, build-outs that might undermine, ultimately, uh, U.S. Uh, policy objectives in this part of the world? It's a good question, Richard. Um, I haven't seen much um, either per your suggestion. Um, it's not clear to me whether this is, you know, a real uh, doctrinal shift that reflects um, a conventionally weaker Russia. It's not, it's not clear if this is aimed more at NATO or if it's aimed at um, other countries that, uh, that border Russia, that, that Russia is concerned about. But to the extent Russia believes that it can get political and security benefits out of that, this strategy, I mean, I think that it's likely to find that, um, th that it can't safely get those kind of benefits from this, and that the, the costs and obstacles of using nuclear weapons um, are are significant. Um, so I think it's a, 
again, it's something worth for, further exploring. Nikolai Sokov, I believe, had a good article on the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists recently on this, on this issue that I would recommend to folks. Okay, that's all the time we have for questions. Now we'll move to closing statements. Each of you will have five minutes, and you get to go first. The very fact that we're having this conversation right now is, is what matters. Um, prior to 2014, it would have been very strange if Kingston and I were up here on this panel talking about uh, old, sometimes nostalgic in a way, since uh, these Cold War concepts haven't been dusted off from the shelves and examined in, in, a, in, in, a, in the cold, real light of, of 2014 or the 21st century. These concepts, uh, long developed over decades of U.S. national security thinking uh, are important because they convey what we're playing for. What do I mean? At the end of the day, we have a U.S. military might that completely out measures Russia's uh, ability to, to really threaten us in, in a serious way. Uh, our defense spending dwarfs Russian GDP. So compared to the United States, sure. Uh, Russia's uh, military threat isn't that significant. However, compared to our allies in Central Europe, that threat is very real, and they feel an urgency after Crimea that they're responding to. What we'd like to see from a U.S. policy perspective is that these allies develop strategies that are conducive to greater predictability and stability in, in Central Europe, and not the alternative. I believe that if we approach it from that three pillared perspective, uh, an approach, a policy approach that looks to reassure, a policy approach that looks to deter and ultimately robustly defend European NATO in the event of an unforeseen or unwanted crisis. I believe that we can have a safer European security environment and more broadly, a safer global security environment. If we don't act, if we continue to maintain our old thinking, we risk a far more dangerous world. That's because our assumptions were made at a very different time, at a time when Russia was acting differently, when Russia was communicating its intentions, uh, it was communicating different intentions. Uh, those assumptions have to be re-examined. Uh, to, do, to do otherwise, I think, is to be derelict in our own duty to protect Europe. When we begin to assess those assumptions, why did we promise this for that? Why did we create NATO's posture this way versus that? When we begin to assess those assumptions, I think the takeaway is that the world has absolutely changed. We need to change to reflect the new realities of that world rather than the old realities of the 1990s. I think there's some very practical, minimalist and maximalist options that NATO can begin to consider at its upcoming summit later this year. Uh, ideally, the first line item on the agenda for NATO should be what does a robust territorial defense of the alliance look like after Crimea? I think that it has a very significant conventional dimension to that defense. Uh, I think it has a very significant air and missile defense, protective dimension to it. And I also think, at the end of the day, NATO has to stay in the nuclear business. Our U.S. Uh, extended deterrent to Europe must be clear and undeniable, not only to our allies, also to Russia, and also to the countries around the world that are watching for signs of weakness or hesitation on the part of the United States. We don't want that. If we don't reassess the organizing strategic dimensions of where NATO was then and where NATO is now, we make a very grave error. I'd like to see us avoid that mistake. And it could begin and should begin at, N at NATO's summit in, in Wales uh, later on this year. When it comes to what the United States can finally do in order to ensure that the world maintains that level of predictability and minimizes the threat of future proliferation, uh, I think at the end of the day, we cannot rule out the, pre uh, the, pre um, uh, the predominance of a sub-strategic option uh, in the event of a crisis. Thank you. So Peter and I agree on sorry. Peter and I agree on many things. We agree that Russia's aggression against Crimea requires a strong U.S. and NATO response. We agree on the need to support Ukraine and assure our Central and Eastern European allies. Yet moving tactical their weapons eastward in response to the crisis reminds me of the oft-used quote 
when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Similar such proposals made by some in Congress and the expert community to increase the role nuclear, of nuclear weapons and missile defense, such as accelerating implementation of the European phase adaptive approach, stopping implementation of New START, and speeding up the modernization of U.S. nuclear forces fit into a similar category. But other than maintaining a core deterrent, there is no role for nuclear weapons in solving the current situation. The United States is appropriately responding to the crisis with a mix of sanctions against Russia, economic aid to Ukraine, and conventional military support to our allies in NATO. The United States and NATO should not initiate an escalatory cycle that increases the nuclear danger in Europe. Meanwhile, while NATO members are likely to be loath to discuss the future of the existing roughly 180 B-61s and their associated dual-capable aircraft in Europe in the lead-up to this year's NATO summit meeting, I don't believe that the alliance can continue to kick the can down the road in perpetuity. We need to look beyond the current crisis of the moment and seriously assess alternative forms of nuclear, nuclear sharing and basing, including the zero option, in ways that maintain alliance cohesion, provide reassurance to the most vulnerable members of NATO, and contribute to NATO's larger nonproliferation and disarmament goals. Sooner or later, the weapons will be removed from Europe, certainly not tomorrow, maybe not even in 10 years. But it would be far preferable if NATO gets out ahead of where the status quo seems to be leading rather than have to scramble when it is already too late. Thank you very much. Um, if everyone would please join me in, me in thanking both of our speakers. And thank you all very much for coming out tonight. Um, please feel free to stick around. There's still some food and drink left um, out in the reception area and to continue the discussions that we started tonight. And um, we appreciate all of your time. Thanks.